This is the second in a series of four videos on current scientific understanding of the most fundamental aspects of colour, focusing on the basic attributes or dimensions of colour and their physical and biological basis. This second video looks at hue, the colour attribute represented by position around a hue circle or colour wheel, and addresses some common misconceptions about colour vision. In the first video, we saw that a colour, such as red or white or green, is the way in which we perceive the overall balance of the spectral composition of a light or of the intrinsic spectral reflectance of an object. White as a colour of light is the way in which we perceive an overall even balance of spectral composition, regardless of small scale differences. Hue is the way we perceive a direction of imbalance or bias in spectral composition. We also saw that this view of colour can be traced back to the researches of Sir Isaac Newton as summed up in the colour circle from his optics of 1704. In Newton's diagram, the direction of imbalance of the common centre of gravity of the rays towards Y determines the hue of the light, in this case, orange. We now understand that this system is two-dimensional because it depends on the balance of three components of light corresponding to the long, middle and short wavelength parts of the spectrum. Before we look at how our visual system is thought to respond to this balance, let's explore the circuit of hues perceptually by using a computer screen, which, not coincidentally, is a device for emitting long, middle and short wavelength light in different proportions. When I make the levels of these three components equal on my device, the components are in a similar balance to daylight, specifically a daylight illuminant called D65. And when my eyes are adapted to my screen, I see no hue. Now let's look at the different directions of imbalance that we can create on the screen, thinking of this as emitting different mixtures of wavelengths rather than mixtures of red, green and blue. When there's a certain imbalance towards long wavelengths, we see a somewhat orangish red. As we shift the average direction of the imbalance towards shorter wavelengths by adding a middle wavelength component, we see the hue shift towards yellow. And as we shift it further by removing the long wavelengths, the hue shifts to yellowish green. Adding a short wavelength component shifts the average direction of imbalance towards shorter wavelengths again, and we see blue-green. Removing the middle wavelength component shifts the direction of imbalance to the short wavelength end of the spectrum, and we perceive blue. Now, adding the long wavelength component again results in an imbalance towards the two ends of the spectrum, and we see magenta. And finally, removing the short wavelength component returns us to the long wavelength bias seen as orangish red. To sum up, if the long, middle and short wavelength components are balanced, as in daylight, we perceive the light from the screen as lacking hue. Otherwise, there is a closed circuit of possible directions of imbalance or bias towards long, middle, short and long and short wavelengths that we perceive as a closed circuit of hues. Correspondingly, objects that reflect light evenly through the spectrum are perceived to lack hue, appearing black, grey or white. The hue of an object is the way in which we perceive the direction of imbalance among the wavelengths it reflects, that is, in its intrinsic spectral reflectance. Notice that bright orange and yellow objects reflect a broad range of wavelengths with a similar average bias to orange and yellow screen colours.
They do not reflect just the yellow or just the orange appearing parts of the spectrum, respectively, as is sometimes claimed. An object that did reflect such a small proportion of the light falling on it would appear much darker. Green and blue paints reflect light of a range of middle wavelengths and short wavelengths respectively. And purplish paints reflect light predominantly from the two ends of the spectrum. Once again, there is a closed circuit of directions of imbalance towards long, middle, short, and long and short wavelengths that we see as a circuit of hues. This circuit of hues we saw on the screen is commonly described as showing, quote, additive color mixing. But is it really the colors that are mixing? In some cases, it seems so. When we mix green and blue light, we get a mixture that is both bluish and greenish. And when we mix blue and red light, we get a magenta mixture that is both reddish and bluish. But if we mix red and green light in the right proportion, we can get a yellow colour that is neither reddish nor greenish. This striking anomaly illustrates the concept of the unique hues. According to this concept, only the four hues red, yellow, green and blue can be experienced as pure, and all other hues are perceived as combinations of adjacent pairs of these. So we can think of a greenish yellow and a reddish yellow, but somewhere between these there is a yellow that is neither greenish nor reddish. Similarly, we can think of orangish and purplish reds, but between these there is a red that is neither, and so on. In contrast, all orange hues have a, both a red and a yellow component, and different orange hues differ by their proportions of these components. The four unique hues are recognised in CIE terminology and are incorporated into the CIE definition of hue, that is, attribute of a visual perception according to which an area appears to be similar to one of the colours red, yellow, green and blue, or to a combination of adjacent pairs of these colours considered in a closed ring. Outside the CIE system, they form the basis of hue designation in the Scandinavian natural colour system. Historically, the idea that the hue circle consists of a ring of successive combinations of red, yellow, green and blue first appears in a passage on colour terminology in the Farben Lira of 1810 by Goethe. Further back, the earliest diagram of a colour order system in a manuscript by Siegfriedus Forcius from 1611 shows five families of colours stretching between black and white through red, yellow, green, blue and grey. And earlier again, the four unique hues appear along with white and black as the six simple colours in one passage in the Treatise on Painting by Leonardo and a generation earlier in a Treatise on Architecture by Filarete. The four unique hues are very commonly, though not inextricably, linked with the concept of hue opponency that the visual system generates two hue-related signals, one being either red or green, and the other being either yellow or blue. This theory, proposed in the late 19th century by Ewald Herring, figures widely as a component of contemporary models of colour vision. We're now ready to look at the biology of hue perception which relies ultimately on three classes of light-sensitive cells in the retina lining the interior of the eye, called L, M and S cone cells. Science communicators often say that these cone cell classes are most sensitive to red, green and blue light respectively, and colour them accordingly, or even refer to them as red, green and blue cone cells.
While this simplification may seem harmless, it unfortunately has led to a cascade of misunderstandings about colour vision that I call the YouTube theory of colour vision, which appears in videos with more than 20 million views. To begin with, it does nothing to dispel the assumption that these red, green and blue hues are properties of wavelengths of light, and it understandably leads to the assumption that these three cone types individually detect red, green and blue wavelengths. Together, these assumptions lead to the conclusion commonly encountered in online discussions of colour vision that we, quote, only really see three colours. The eye is sometimes portrayed as sending red, green and blue signals along the optic nerve to the main body of the brain. So the story goes that when the brain receives a combination of signals that could be produced by a real colour, that is, a colour existing in the spectrum, it thinks it sees that colour. For example, if it receives a mix of red and green cone signals, it thinks it sees yellow. And if no so-called yellow wavelengths are present in the stimulus, then the brain is said to have been fooled or tricked, since it's assumed that the purpose of colour vision is to detect specific wavelengths. When the brain receives a combination of red and blue but no green cone signals, it is said to make up a colour, magenta, because this combination of signals could not be produced by a real colour of the spectrum. In some versions, an extra peak of the red cone response is added in the violet region to account for the otherwise unexplained reddishness of violet light. In reality, no cone cell type detects wavelengths of a single colour band of the spectrum. The L cone, or so-called red cone class, responds to all visible wavelengths. It responds most strongly in the middle part of this range, which we see as greenish-yellow, but once stimulated it cannot distinguish which wavelength caused the response. Individually, it is completely colourblind. This important property of all cone cell responses is called univariance. The M cone, or so-called green cone, responds to all but the longest visible wavelengths. While the S cone responds to a narrower range of wavelengths in the violet to green range. While our three cone cell types do not individually detect particular wavelengths, they do divide the spectrum into three bands, in each of which one cone cell type responds more than the other two. And so our visual system can respond to the overall distribution of energy through the spectrum by comparing the three cone responses through a process called cone opponency. One cone opponent process, L versus M, responds to the balance of energy between the long and the middle to short wavelengths, while another process, S versus LM, responds to the balance of energy between the short and the middle to long wavelengths. So, a long wavelength or red screen phosphor would generate L greater than M and LM greater than S cone opponent signals. A middle wavelength or green phosphor would generate M greater than L and LM greater than S cone opponent signals. And a short wavelength or blue phosphor would generate M greater than L and S greater than LM cone opponent signals. In a certain proportion, these three lights could balance both cone opponent signals at zero, and in other proportions can generate a wide range of combinations of cone opponent signals that we ultimately experience as the wide range of colours that we see on our screens. When the LM versus S and L versus M cone opponent processes were first discovered, it was thought that these were the basis of yellow versus blue and red versus green hue opponency.
but it was later found that these cone opponent processes do not align with the unique hue positions. Currently, the input to the visual system by opponent processing of cone responses seems well established, as is the perceptual output as combinations of four unique hues. However, the location in the brain where the postulated hue opponent signals arise has so far remained elusive, and there is some evidence that the four unique hues may not in fact have an opponent relationship. Nevertheless, it seems clear that perceptions of red, green and blue arise at a late stage in visual processing, and it can only cause confusion to use these colour names for the cone or cone opponent outputs. We've been concerned here only with how the visual system detects variations in the balance of wavelengths in different areas of the visual field. Perception of colours of objects is a different matter and depends on unconscious comparisons within the visual field. For example, a blue appearing area might be perceived as a blue object under white light or as a white object under blue light, and the same object colour can be perceived in areas of the, vis of the visual field that send very different light stimuli to the eye. It's therefore entirely false to suppose that an object colour such as white is associated with a particular set of cone responses. We'll look at object colour perception in the next video, three dimensions of colour or more. To sum up, different wavelengths of light appear different hues, but these hues do not reside in the wavelengths themselves. Hue is the way in which we perceive the direction of imbalance in the spectral composition of a light, including the extreme spectral imbalance of a single wavelength. White light does not contain the hues of the spectrum. It contains a balance of wavelengths that evokes no hue. Second, our cone cells do not individually detect wavelengths of a single hue. The S cones respond to a range of wavelengths appearing violet, blue and green, while the L and M cones respond to all and almost all wavelengths of light respectively. Third, the cone cells send signals direct to the brain only in the sense that the retina in the eye is considered to be part of the brain. Colour perceptions are ultimately based on comparisons of these cone signals beginning in the retina by the process of cone opponency. Fourth, the cone opponent apparatus allows our visual system to respond to variations in the balance of long, middle and short wavelength components of light across the visual field. Our visual system responds to the physical circuit of directions of imbalance among these components with a physiological circuit of possible combinations of S versus LM and L versus M cone opponent signals. This physiological circuit is ultimately experienced as a continuous perceptual circuit described in terms of successive combinations of red, yellow, green and blue hues. Non-spectral hues like magenta arise in the same way as spectral hues, but signify an imbalance that it is impossible for a single wavelength to create. The scale of hues is not a line that we artificially bend into a circle. It is a continuous loop of which only a linear segment can be evoked by single wavelengths. Finally, there is no reason to suppose that the purpose of colour vision is to detect individual wavelengths of light. Even approximately monochromatic light is very rare in our environment. Our visual system is not fooled when we see a mixture of so-called red and green wavelengths as yellow. It succeeds in detecting that this mixture has the same overall direction of imbalance as a yellow appearing wavelength.